Queer Poem A Day Lineage Edition is our new format for this year. This is the third year that we've done Queer Poem A Day. The first two years, we actually had 60 poems, one for each day of June. This year, we decided to mix up the format, ask poets to read not just a poem of their own, but also the language we used was a work of an LGBTQIA plus writer of the past and an original poem of their own. So already we can see the categories are a little bit open here. People could choose something that's not a poem, which several people did. And the question of ancestry or lineage is a very interesting and fraught one. This isn't an easy um, who are my parents kind of question artistically. And of course, that also has a different valence for queer voices. So I'm going to go through just a handful of the 13 different poets that we had do this lineage project and show you examples by using just one line from the lineage poem that they chose, and then one line from the poem of their own. And as we're thinking about this, I'm kind of investigating this idea of what words do we come from? Things like religions, categories, descriptors, or identities, all of these come down to words. Looking at the past, those dead has a strange valence for queer lives. The often suppressed lives of the past, though we should be careful to not think we know the past too much and how suppressed they were to themselves. But as we're entering into this talk here, we're gonna watch our poets struggle with this prompt we gave them of lineage. Just as all poets struggle, I sometimes think that the secret history of every poem is how did this poem get made? How can I speak at all? That's kind of the subject of every poem. How can I speak in words these inexpressible feelings? And particularly in a context where I know because of marginalization, how fleeting these words are and how changing that's an insight or a truth. So we're gonna look at our first poem, which was our first poem of this lineage year. The poet Richie Hoffman chose a poem by Walt Whitman called Reconciliation. And then his poem was also called Reconciliation. He is addressing this most canonical American poet, Walt Whitman, who also was queer. And the subject becomes reconciliation, not just of the Civil War dead, which is what Whitman is addressing. He was a nurse in the Civil War. And not just reconciling the living, but also the way Ritchie interprets it, a young Ritchie Hoffman is spreading his great grandmother's ashes at sea. And he didn't really know her. And he learned that she owned an early edition of Leaves of Grass. Did it include him? Was his existence thought of? What of these poems of the past, of whose work we make the claim of containing the most beauty and subjectivity a human can express? Do they include me? So the line I chose from the Whitman poem to share with you, a man divine as myself is dead. So, too, Richie thinks, I will be dead. I do not know even where this book was lost. Richie may be saying, I will be annihilated one way or another. It strengthens us to hold on to the past, but it also reveals how vulnerable we are, delineating this vulnerability. What does the past and what does a poem actually do? Another wonderful example 
the poet Derek Austin chose a poem by Robert Hayden. Many of you may know Robert Hayden's widely anthologized poem, Those Winter Sundays, which ends, What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? As Derek tells us in our episode, Robert Hayden was married to a woman seemingly happily, but revealed his bisexuality in his journals. And Derek actually lived nearby him when he went to school. And he must have thought, what would it be like to be this man making this life of art and respectability that excluded publicly this part of himself, but included it on the private page? So Derek chooses this poem that's about this peacock room, I'll show you in a second, that the painter Whistler made. And one of the opening lines is, which is crueler, life or art? And then Derek's ending line is, I've wanted to be hurt into gold. And I'm going to show you these rooms now. So here is the Whistler room, very beautiful and perhaps ugly. And then Derek actually went kind of on a pilgrimage to see this room because he loved this poem so much. And I would suspect loved that question so much, which is crueler life or art. And Hayden really digs into that um, in this poem and the kind of ridiculousness of creating this perfect room. Of course, the word stanza that we talk about as a section of a poem means room. So when Derek went to see this, it wasn't there. The lineage couldn't be accessed. It was reinterpreted by an artist while the Peacock Room was being restored. So interesting to think of all these layers in our little lineage project. So the artist Darren Waterston, uh, Waterston created a piece called Filthy Lucre where he created the room what it would look like if it aged. So you can see these pictures here of it crumbling and decaying. And again, the question, which is crueler, art or life? Derek Austin thinking of our own predicament, seeing an artist's rendering of the Peacock Room aged, wonders how these arts obscured historical pain, had pain in their making, and how we still participate in that pain when we make a poem. I've wanted to be hurt into gold. So we're struggling with lineage, but we're also struggling with the idea of creating art at all. Our third uh, offering for this year was a pairing of Adrian Rich and Maggie Milner. Adrian Rich's poem begins, what kind of beast would turn its life into words? What atonement is this all about? And yet, writing words like these, I'm also living. Why am I doing this? But I'm also living doing this. This must be a thing as much as any straight writer felt the pen in their hand. I do too but I'm troubled by it. Maggie Milner discovering a love of women later in life while in a relationship with a man in her book, Couplets, a very refined form imagines her lover singing. Here's the book. I'll even show you how it looks on the page there. Those kinds of two line pairs. So she imagines her lover singing, the quaver in her voice when she first sang, the song that afterward became the anthem of our romance named. The very intentionally rhymed couplets in this book. So this idea of repression, a thesis which many would have us trouble, but in our era of book banning and curriculum banning, 
and even the threats we've received from doing this program. And we're very lucky here with all the support. It emerges as sort of an obvious thing that we must say, right? Even if our voices quaver, we're going to rhyme, became, and named. We're going to name all of these loves. There's also part of Maggie Milner's book, um, some of the sections have these long blocks of text you can see here. And then there's one little line at the end and that line does rhyme with the end of the block of text. So that's still considered for her a couplet. In this section, she quotes Audre Lorde. I actually have this quoted here. Let me get to the next slide. Lord wrote that women's subjugation had historically meant a suppression of the erotic as, con as a considered source of power and information within our lives, and further warned that the erotic, when it was expressed, was often mistaken for the pornographic and dismissed out of hand. What's threatening is knowledge of self and other to ourselves and others. Poetry can do this by the way. Now I want to share with you this amazing pairing that the poet Tara Skirtu chose with this Elizabeth Bishop poem. Tara Skirtu's teacher, Lloyd Schwartz, actually discovered this poem that Bishop wrote to her girlfriend. Poetry can do this too across time, like this sort of old fashioned picture. It can discover a past, a love in the face of inevitable death. That's how Tara describes it. I excerpt uh, the poem here, the Bishop poem. I kiss your funny face, your coffee flavored mouth. Last night I slept with you. Today I love you so, how can I bear to go? As soon I must, I know. To bed with ugly death in that cold, filthy place, to sleep there without you, without the easy breath and night-long, limb-long warmth I've grown accustomed to. Once death is introduced as a subject, as it is introduced disproportionately to queer people. Each line becomes defiant and joyous, even if it's sad, even if it's silly, even if it means nothing. So Tara, in her wonderful episode, I recommend it. She says, I really recommend you do this thing at the end of the poem. I'll read the end of her poem here. Today I did walked into your morning shower fully clothed, all the moments we stop ourselves just because we might feel embarrassed or impractical or get wet. More fears of the erotic that could get mistaken for pornography. So the poet Chen Chen chose Justin Chin's poem, Lick My Butt. And we were lucky enough to have a conversation with Chen about it. So that's a really special episode where Lisa and I talk for over 30 minutes to Chen about why we would include a poem like that. It's a brilliant conversation and defends the reason why every type of poem has to be included in a library. I'm not going to sum up all of it, but one of my favorite parts I'll mention here is when we talk about the in, the queerness inherent in even the most public celebrations, pageantry and artistry and costume. So it was like the gay pride parade, the ice capades, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade and Christmas happening all at once. And it keeps increasing these levels of public renown and pageantry from the gay pride parade making a direct line to Christmas. Chen's response is 
really beautiful reimagining a world where the category of innocent didn't need to be invented in the first place. I'll read it here. And this poem, by the way, was directly addressing Justin Chin and dedicated to Chin, who died um, of complications from AIDS in, I believe, 2015 in his early 40s. The fact, the fact I'd love to dispute, deny, but can't, that it took until college to find books and writers, both queer and Asian, how I'm still shedding the unaliveness, the lie, that queer and Asian must mean un and never innocent. Finally, we ended our season just a couple days ago by reopening the present. So Amanda Gunn, um, whose wonderful book, let me grab it, I have here, just came out this year, Things I Didn't Do With This Body. And Amanda Gunn actually, for the first year, I believe, right, of Queer Poem A Day, gave us the title poem for this, um, Things I Didn't Do With This Body and Things I Did. It's a wonderful poem. Um, Amanda Gunn really felt strongly about doing this long poem a Woman is Talking to Death, which, by the way, could be a subtitle of my whole talk here. A Woman is Talking to Death. It's a brilliant long poem by the living poet, Judy Gron. So we sort of debated with ourselves, can we do a living poet? But then it felt like the perfect way to end, to reopen back out into the present. It's a long poem. It takes over 25 minutes to read. It describes scenes of lesbians in extremis, helping in a gruesome accident, defending themselves at trial. Near the ending of this remarkable reading, I think Amanda reads this poem better than anyone. <laughs> she says, to my lovers, I bequeath the rest of my life. Now that could be read as queer solidarity. It can also be read as a commitment from Judy Gran to her, to her readers or to the poets that she continues to draw inspiration from in her 80s. The next line supports you the rest of my life. In Amanda Gunn's poem, the second to last line of our last poem for this year, she writes, a poem says the same each time you meet it. Not a poem says the same thing each time you meet it. Because it doesn't say the same thing. It reflects whoever reads it, it becomes universal or particular as mirrors can do both. A poem says the same each time you meet it. We write against death. Thank you very much. And I will turn this over now to the absolutely wonderful Lisa Hayden. Hello, everyone. Uh, Dylan, that was so beautiful. I intimidated to follow that. Um, I hope you'll all have a listen to all of the episodes, um, but especially that one that Dylan has ended with. It was very special to have Amanda read that grand, huge poem. It takes on so much of what all of us are up to as writers, but also what all of us are up against uh, in this time and in 
since the beginning of our marked time in our community. I'm gonna read a sort of poetic essay to begin anyway. A piece of music. The word lyric comes from the Greek lurikos or lura, meaning lyre, the instrument, not the fibster. To play a song with a lyre, in this art of poetry, the words themselves in arrangement become music instead of noise. Where we might have had a lyre in our hands in ancient times, we've replaced it instead with a book. I'm thinking of my mother holding Goodnight Moon up to me at bedtime, the lyrical lullaby that put me to sleep. Me and my room, a red balloon, the moon. It's an ordinary memory, one nearly every person in this time and language has shared of that seemingly simple work being read aloud in libraries and bedrooms. Lineage. We think of this word in relation to ancestry and inheritance. In its most basic etymology, though, it simply means line. This season, our poets used their own lines of poetry to draw lines between themselves and the lyrics of our queer past. In each episode, we might receive this as fishing the line down into the well of lyrical or linguistic time. We see it from the onset of this season in Richie Hoffman's study of Walt Whitman. Whitman's poem Reconciliation begins with these three words, word over all. Hoffman's poem of the same name begins, I was told. Even in the first three words, Hoffman's speaker believes what has been told to him, what has been said by another. In the world of Hoffman's reconciliation, we believe what is told by our elders. In the narrative sense, we're talking about his grandmother. I was told that she had traveled to the cemetery in Camden, not far from our family home, and snipped a vine at the entrance to Whitman's tomb. As the poem goes through its narrative on the horizontal axis, we learn that the grandmother had a copy of Leaves of Grass, that the book was lost, that the family storyteller, this speaker, the poet, will never have or inherit that book. Between the speaker and the sky, though, this absence of words leads to another lineage to word over all, to the words this speaker writes to fill the void, the lonesome of not having the book itself, the thing he'll always be fishing a line toward. If we back further away, we see more than each poet fishing a line down and pulling up the work of influence. In June of 2021, the first poem we aired was Pride Month by Shelley Wong. The poem begins with these three words. It is June. Wong's poem uses this as more than words, but as a repeated phrase, as what poets call anaphora, our kind of music. It is June, and I read about having grace to forgive those who would condemn us. It is June and a man reads a poem. It was June when I was awake past midnight gathering news about the Pulse nightclub shooting. It is June and I am happy. It is June and I have never prayed. The secret the poem keeps is that those three words were once alone a full sentence. In The Truth the Dead Know by Anne Sexton, the poem begins like this. Gone, I say, and walk from church, refusing the stiff procession to the grave, letting the dead ride alone in the hearse. It is June. I am tired of being brave. There's the poem in the well and the poet fishing for it. 
but a larger ripple begins, and the lines now have to make constellations. The lineage is being preserved right here in these archives. In Donuts by Dan Cranes, the speaker is getting a haircut and letting us in on an encounter with the stylist. When I asked for your pronouns, you said, you accept them all. What will I do for pride? You want to know. It's not only about the month of June anymore. As the poems accumulate, the constellations will call June. It becomes about the queer experience of pride, of dignity. How much bravery does it require to be dignified? How much tenderness? How much, how much exhaustion? How much silence? How much rage? Other constellations besides June hang in our made sky. Prayer for our safety in body and in community in poems like Prayer for My Trans Siblings by H. Melt and Is This or Is This True Happiness by Derek Austin and Want Could Kill Me by Zan Phillips. How that constellation of prayer reflects and draws toward another constellation about hiding and coming out. I'm thinking of The Kisses the Lovers Sneak in Temple Square in Salt Lake City by Christian Gallette, and the speaker who makes, quote, her inside places whisper, woman, 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 instead of saying it aloud to her father in birthday suits by J.J. Espinoza. Love songs about our nuanced expressions of eros in poems like Love Song by Eileen Miles and What a Waste by Jill McDonough. The constellation of the unrequited connected by poems like The Men We Loved by Cyril Wong, The Men We Loved, The Men We Had, The Men We Wanted, Unsent Draft by Rachel Menes, The Non-Lover in Riding the Bus Back to Oxford by Catherine Pond, who, quote, wishes she was a lesbian, and then begs the speaker not to get sick of her anyway. The queer self, the queer family, word over all, beautiful as the sky, this sky, we've made. It is June, and I am tired of being brave. There is a constellation that I have left out. It's the one our season begins and ends with. It is absence. Over the three years of this podcast, we have made many poems that address and inherit the AIDS crisis. The piece of music you've heard all season is the AIDS word scherzo, by Robert Savage. He wrote it by hand while he was being treated for AIDS. It was almost lost entirely, save for Danny Bear's hands playing it. The same way and the same motions that Robert Savage's may have too. There are so many lines left to fish out of the well, and we will not stop waiting for what might reach out to us from the past. In Danny's description of how to play this music, he told us so much about the strange way that Savage described how it should be played. Instead of the usual Italian words, one of my favorite moments is soft bitter. It comes from sweet bitter, which we now call bittersweet, which comes from Sappho, the most ancient of queer poets that I could name. Robert Savage demands, like all good poems, that you play it from the predicament of the person who wrote it. Good Night Moon is not a universal text. It comes from a queer predicament. It was panned when it first came out for being, quote, too sentimental. All I want now is queer sentimentality. Our tenderness despite such violence that tries to catapult us back into hidden corners of culture, of the body, of the mind. Thank you. Let me, um, hello everyone. Um, that was, Absolutely remarkable, Lisa. We're just going um, to open this up for any questions. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your 
uh, Zoom screen there. And while we're waiting to look at questions, I just wanted to show you our website, deerfieldlibrary.org slash queerpoemaday. I wanna say two things as well. Uh, one, I just wanna thank everybody for the overwhelming support that we've received after some uh, online hate and some calls. Um, many libraries would not do this kind of program. Many communities would not show up in the way that they have. It's been overwhelming the amount of calls and emails and bodies that we've uh, encountered uh, in support of this program and programs for kids that we do that are fully inclusive of everybody um, who comes to the library. So this is our website, Queer Poem A Day. And right now, the homepage has this lineage edition on it. So many of the poets you can see here, you can scroll through. And if you click on them, you'll get the text of their original poem. And you can just click play up there to hear the full episode with the music Lisa just described, with the poet reading their lineage poem in full and then discussing um, why that poem was so meaningful to them and how their own poem responds. It's really, um, we're really proud of this year and how educational it is. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing, let's see. Let's see if we can, okay, good. Um, the final thing I wanted to say uh, to everyone is about that music. So tomorrow, we have been releasing Monday, Wednesday, Friday every day this month. Tomorrow, there should be a poem for Friday. And what we've actually uncovered is a missing piece of lineage. So music by the composer Robert Savage um, has been featured, as Lisa talked about the AIDS word scherzo, by our, uh, played by our pianist Daniel Baer. Um, tomorrow morning on your podcast feeds on our website, we will be revealing the hidden lineage of Savage to um, a really foundational poet to many uh, today, John Ashbery, many um, queer poets, uh, many poets in general. So um, we are exceptionally excited to share this. We, we're kind of breaking news um, tomorrow. <laughs> so um, we can send that link out to all of you uh, who joined us. And uh, we'll see if there's any questions here. Do they know that they can only write them in? <laughs> yeah, so I think we don't have the chat feature open, but if you'd like, you can use the, the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom. We'll just wait a couple more minutes. Um, thank you again for coming and um, supporting us. And I know we're leaving you a little early here, but I think we gave you uh, plenty of of stuff to think about. I was uh, tearing up over in the corner when Lisa was speaking. So. Thank <laughs> and thank you all for being here. I'm seeing so many familiar names that I'm really touched that you you made the time tonight. Do we have one? Thank you, Marsha, uh, who wrote in. Thank you for a beautiful experience and an opportunity to open minds and hearts. Thank you so much, Marsha. All right. Thank you all so much. You can email us. Um, please check out the website. Uh, I'm so glad you could come. Oh, thank you, Sandy, for coming. I was wondering who that was, but now I understand. <laughs> Uh, thank you again for all the support. It means the world. Have a good night. Bye.